needed this portion, this section that is extremely powerful. What Paul the Apostle employs by way of argument is very foreign to us in the Western world. His argumentation is shocking. That's why the book of Romans is studied in some schools of law, is because how he presents his argument is done in such a way that he knows where he's beginning and he knows where he's going to end, but the person that is listening to the argument uh, is engulfed in this, uh, what's the word, a, a cacophony of truth. It's every direction you go. We're surrounded by this truth. We're not quite sure where he's going to go. And when he lands, you are standing there shocked with nowhere to go but to God. And it is absolutely epic. We're, we're treading upon holy ground. I told you last week that this is a portion of scripture that frankly, most, I got to confess, and I don't blame them. Most pastors will read through chapter three and get into chapter four. It's just too hard, but I'm not very smart. So what I do is I dive into the hard things to find out if we can make any sense of them. And I think when we come to hard things in the Bible, those are treasure chests that are waiting to be pried open for those who will take the time. And you stumbled into a church this morning that has decided to take the time. Okay? So, Romans chapter 3, I'll begin reading in verse 1. We'll go down to verse 8. If you pick it up in the even numbered verses, Romans 3 verse 1, he says, What advantage then has the Jew... Or what is the profit of circumcision? For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Verse 5, but if our, listen now, this is one of those arguments. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. For if the truth of God has increased through my lie or sin, to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil that Father, we pray that you would give us an extra keen sense on this morning that we might be able to receive what your Holy Spirit teaches us today. And God, you know my heart. I pray that you would break every preconceived notion of all of us. I know this place is called a church. I know that we've got four walls. I know that we've got a parking lot and we have a cross out over the courtyard and the bells ring and all of the trappings of tradition. And I'm asking you to blow it all up, God. That every single one of us today, those that are here and those that are afar, that we might have to encounter you today. And that can only happen by the Holy Spirit upon whom I lean. God, please don't let us do church today. May, may we in this 21st century be church as you would define it. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. You can be seated. The message that we started and now are in part two is titled, And the Answer Is. Paul is going to present arguments and then he's going to give us the answer. It's a setup. It's a divine setup. He knows exactly what he's doing. The apostle being led by the Holy Spirit and the crafting, the breathing, the breath as it were, the New Testament. We're at the 
book of Romans, which is known as the Magna Carta of biblical theology. It is the foundation of New Testament truth. The first thing that we saw last time together was the fact that in verses one and two, when we ask or say the answer is, he made it clear it is the word of God. In verse one, he asked the question, what advantage then has the Jew? He just got done undermining everything about the Jew in chapter two for them trusting in outward ordinances and outward circumcision. Remember that. He, being a Jew, begins to attack the Jew on the fact that you're looking to your righteousness based upon external good works and performance, which you ought to know is flawed from the beginning. He doesn't discredit good works. In fact, when God truly goes to work in your life, the manifestation of God's presence is good works. But good works cannot save. And that example is given in this sacrament of circumcision. That if my outward flesh is removed, that is dead of nerve and feeling, then it must be true about my life internally. And Paul says, no. You can go through water baptism. means absolutely nothing. Outward circumcision as a Jew means absolutely nothing. You can take uh, confirmation, you can take communion, you can take your whatever rules and regulations or traditions, or for that matter, whatever is revealed in scripture as an outward act. If you begin to lean on that for your salvation, Paul will teach you that you have fallen from grace because if you're trusting in externals, I go to church, well, I go to Calvary, That that might be... Worse for you. <laughs> I come from a long line of Christians. My grandpa was a pastor, you might say. It means nothing to God. Zero. No, it's the word of God. Because the Bible tells us what advantage does the Jew have? So now he's saying there is an advantage to the Jews. What profit is circumcision? Well, no profit unless we looked at number two, which is this. The fact that everything is going according to plan. Because he said in verse 2, what advantage? Well, much in every way. Here comes the answer. Chiefly this, because to them were committed the oracles of God. God decided that he would reveal himself through his word to the Jewish people. That's why you've always heard that they are called the chosen people. He chose them to reveal himself through them. And he gave them the word of God. And I'm going to say, I, I, I'm going to say something that I said last week. And it created, it cr- created some angst and some comments from those in the Jewish community. And I said simply this. And I guess the Holy Spirit used it. I said, if you're Jewish... You're the ones that are supposed to be giving us the word of God. You're the ones that are to be preaching us the gospel. It was God's intent. That's why Jerusalem was the epicenter of the birth of the church. It was the Jew that was tapped by God to take his oracles to the ends of the earth. And I said, if you're Jewish, you need to tell the world the gospel. And of course, the response was online and by text or email, I'm Jewish and I won't have nothing to do with the gospel. That's the problem. That's Paul's point. But everything's going according to plan. God's word is effective. Their disobedience doesn't render the, God, render the word of God to no effect. And then we saw in the closing part of verse 2 that Israel's most challenging days are yet ahead, but God will use Israel. Now, I I mentioned again last time that I was going to take an unorthodox approach to this chapter because it's so difficult, and I'm going to continue to do that. So I'm going to ask you to put on your helmet and get your pen ready, and all this for this reason. I am asking God... Uh, to do the heavy lifting today because predominantly this congregation's Gentile. It means if you're not a Jew, you're Gentile. And uh, it's God's will that all of us as Gentiles be reached with his word, right? 
It's God's will that all of us be encouraged by his word. It's God's will that all of us be uh, holding his word in high esteem, right? And it's also his will that every Jewish person that might be listening or might be here today is challenged to faith. All of these things cannot happen unless God the Holy Spirit does the lifting. Do you agree? So we'll approach it this way. And as we dive in, it's in a sense, I'll be using some of the same uh, verses of Romans, but I'm going to be giving you other verses to add onto your list of last week. Understand this. Isaiah 43, remember this. What advantage has the Jew? Isaiah 43, verse 10 says, you are my witnesses. This is the second week I've given this verse for a reason, says the Lord. And my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe, know and believe and understand that I am he. Before me, there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. That simply means he's eternal. He doesn't have a beginning. He doesn't have an end. Verse 11 I, even I, am Yah, Yahweh. See those capitals? Yahweh, the name of God. Y-A-H, Yah, the Lord. That's his name. And besides me, there's no savior. Verse 12, I have declared and saved. I have proclaimed, and there is no foreign God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, says the Lord. Here it comes, that I am God. That's what God's word says. The number one advantage that the Jews had was the fact that their mission in life and purpose was to make the name of God known. Do you remember the word oracle? Very powerful word. Oracle, where we get the word logos, the eloquence of God. We saw that that word means the communication of God. It's the will of God. That's why church, and I stress again, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. You always tell us to read the Bible. The Bible is God's will. Literally, God's will has been put in black and white print and in every language of the earth that people would know God's will, the Bible. And so listen to this. Revelation chapter 19, verse 9 and 10. Then he, that is John, the apostle, he's the author of the book of Revelation. Then he, an angelic being of some sort, some sort of witness, said, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. And I, that's John, fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. For I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Here it comes. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of the revelation of the oracle of God is none other than Jesus Christ. Which doesn't surprise you. Shouldn't surprise you if you know your Bible. But by the way, in in Revelation 19.10, that word spirit is the word pneuma. Many of you already know that. The word means wind. It means wind-driven, spirit-driven, spirit-powered. It's where we get the word pneumatic or air-powered or that which is air-driven. It's also translated breath or to breathe. Isn't that beautiful if you think about that? The spirit of prophecy. The breath of Jesus Christ is exhaled through what is known as Bible prophecy, the proclamation of God's truth and God's word. That is an awesome biblical truth. And we need to take prophecy very, very carefully. The words, the life, the witness, the message of Jesus is the very point of Bible prophecy. The future is all about Jesus Christ. I love thinking about how and I loved when I first came to the thought that, wow, all of, this, all of this incredibly massive book is all about one person. It's all about one man Amen. that came to us from heaven, which is a powerful, powerful thing. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. I mean this for my Jewish friends first. Matthew chapter 5. By the way, anybody know what Matthew's last name is? It's in the Bible. Say it again. 
Levi. Our Jewish friends don't know that. Matthew's last name is Levi. Levi, Levi. Matthew, Levi. This is a Jew writing to us. Jesus is speaking. This is a Jew talking and this is a Jew writing to us. Matthew is recording this. Jesus said, do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. By the way, young people, everybody. Well, the word of God doesn't say anything about this. And that. The New Testament doesn't say this about that or that or about the other. Does the Old Testament? Yes. Jesus says, I've come to fulfill all of it. You don't pick and choose what Bible verses are real. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one yacht or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Jesus said that. It's a powerful answer, by the way, regarding one of the attributes of the Son of God. And you know this well. John chapter 1, verse 1. Same author of the book of Revelation. Same John. Matthew, Mark, Luke. John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, that is of the physical universe, was, pre-existing the physical universe, was the word of God, or the word, I should say, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. That's not the beginning of God. God did not have a beginning, everybody. Listen, we worship the uncreated creator. Our God is uncreated. At the beginning of creation, he was not only there, he was the genesis of creation. And verse 14 says, John 1, and the word became flesh and tabernacled or lived among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten. That word means the only, the one and only glorified one of the Father. That means, by the way, exclusionary. Listen up. It means that there is no other Savior coming. He's the one. Well, we're waiting for the... He already came. Amen. Well, there's a guy in Chicago or Cincinnati saying he's the Savior. What about that guy in Africa? He's saying he's the, he's the Savior. Nope. Jesus is the one and only glorified one, meaning there'll be no other. I love that. Man, that's bold, isn't it? Well, Pastor, I have a hard time with that. It's such an absolute statement. Oh, I not only love the statement, I love the fact that you're having a hard time with it. You need to wrestle with it until it pins you to the ground and you surrender to the liberating truth of what that means. He is the begotten one of the Father, full of grace and truth. How wonderful. So church, we jump in now to the next argument found in verse 3. And that is, and the answer is, God is forever faithful. And just because I was feeling sassy, I added a little subtitle, so deal with it. Uh, I may have to edit that before second service, but let's keep it in for first. God is forever faithful, so deal with it. He's not going to go away. And uh, he's not going to change his message. He, God will never be woke. God is never, God is never going to... He doesn't have to wake up to anything. God doesn't have to trend. Okay? And you say, well, why doesn't God just post something? He already did. Right here. The problem is you're not reading it. You got to read it. You should read all of God's posts. They're in the Bible. It's called the Bible. God is forever faithful. It says in verse 3, For what if some did not believe? So what if some of the Jews said, I'm not going to believe. I can't believe. I will not believe. Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? You say, well, I don't believe in God. Literally. That's your problem. That's, all, that's you. Speak for yourself. Well, I have my reasons. Keep them. Seriously. I just ask you, what is it that you are living this grand and amazing gift called life? What are you living it for? What is the purpose that drives you? Do you know a transcendent, uncreated creator... 
who is sending a message called the Bible, who reaches down out of the stars, as it were, and says, I want you to know me. And then you answer back and you struggle with him and you argue with him and you, listen, you decide, I am not going to believe. I'm going to be unfaithful to him. And so thus I conclude that if he exists, he's unfaithful too. Nope, you're wrong. I, I do not believe, thus he's unbelievable. False again. Your disobedience doesn't cause God to change. That's what Paul is saying. This is a deep argument And I got to tell you, we need Paul today to argue it. If he could even, if he could just be here today, we'd want to hear him say it the way that he would say it because he's talking to his own people and we're at a great disadvantage, but I lean upon the Holy Spirit. So will God's existence be without effect because I don't believe The word effect here is an amazing word. We'll show it to you here. The word is to render inoperative. It means to do away with or to abolish, to nullify. Your unbelief, you think, your neglect is something that by you not acknowledging God causes God to disappear. Now, I have this quote, and if it blesses you, then it came from God. If it's weird, then it's it's mine. But this is the thought that I had. Truth is unaffected by your belief system, choices, or lifestyle. Disobedience is based upon your love of sin. Until now, it has been your unwillingness to obey God that has come or become, should say, come to define your life. And you think about that. Some form of belief defines your life. If it's a belief that is unbelief, you still believe in something, but that something is most often you. And it will define your life. If you come to believe in God personally, it will define your life. So God is at work. So I'm going to need you to take a deep breath, and I'm going to need you to get ready to write things down for this reason. I pray every one of you today, today's a training course. Today, you're not going to get any, you know, warm and fuzzy feeling today. You're not going to march out saying, oh, all of my felt needs were met. (laughs) I just loved it. No, I want to equip you today. And when these doors open up, I want this place to be like a Roman uh, vomitorium is the word. (laughs) A vomitorium is the exits of a stadium. When you leave a stadium, those those doors are called vomitoriums. uh, And I think it's Latin. When these doors open up today, I want you to be turned loose. I want hell to shake when you get turned loose today because this should equip you to have a greater faith in the word of God and go find a Jew and love them into the kingdom. And if you wind up scooping up a Muslim or a Buddhist or Baha'i or someone, all the better. But Paul's heart is broken for his Jewish brothers to see the light. Romans 11, verse 26. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I, the Lord, take away their sins. Church family, Paul is quoting in the book of Romans eleven twenty six. The Old Testament. So you need to stop and ask yourself, listen, if you're a skeptic today, a doubter, an unbeliever, if you're Jewish today, God's word says, I've made a covenant with Israel, with the house of Jacob, and it's my covenant. By the way, he doesn't say it's our covenant. You notice that? The covenant that God has made is with himself, not with the Jews. He invites them to partake of the covenant he made with himself. You say, what are you talking about? You need two people to make a covenant. Well, in this case, listen, God put Abraham to sleep. Abraham offers up the sacrifice. He's waiting there to meet with God and he falls asleep. Just like you do in church. You just fall asleep. (laughs) Come to worship, you fall asleep. Abraham sets up the worship, sets up the altar, lays the sacrifice on the altar, and falls asleep. 
And I think God was waiting in the book of Genesis for Abraham to fall asleep. You know why? So Abraham would have nothing to do with it. Seriously, I, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful. I, this is the way I see it in my cartoon mind, which for me works. Abraham, it's all the poor, innocent animal dies, the blood, the altars there. In fact, the Bible even tells us that the vultures were trying to take the sacrifice away and Abraham shushing them off and then evening comes, the vultures go away and Abraham's waiting. And then the next thing you read, <laughs> the great, great lover of God is out like a light. <laughs> and the Bible says when Abraham was asleep, then God appeared. And the Bible tells us that God appeared as a burning torch. And because God could swear by no greater, God swore with himself the covenant that he would make with Abraham, that it would be an everlasting covenant. If he would have shake, shook, shaken, shooken, <laughs> if he would have shaken, still sounds wrong. Don't we have any school teachers in here? If he would have shook, shuck, if he would have shook Abraham's hand, now we got a whole different gospel. Think of it. If God would have shook Abraham's hand, now we got a problem. Because now that involves us keeping the agreement with the shake. I got that part right. Abraham fell asleep as though he were dead. He was out like a light. God says, I'm making a covenant with myself. Guess what? That covenant was with the Father and with the Son that would be empowered by the Holy Spirit. That the covenant was made between blood and promise. And that is the realm of God. Abraham wakes up and he looks around and finds out, wow, do we have a, an amazing covenant that God has given us given us who believe. See, when it says that all of Israel will be saved, we'll study this more in Romans 9, 10, and 11. But it's not all Israel gets saved because they're Jewish. All Israel is the remnant of Israel who believes. They have to be children of Abraham according to faith. For the just shall live by faith, Habakkuk tells us. So here we go. I hope you're able to take this abuse because here it comes. Daniel chapter 9, where do we get this authority to say such things? Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. We touched on it last week briefly. We'll look at it in depth now. Daniel 9, 26 says, The Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Circle that in your Bible. The word cut off in Hebrew is karat. It means, listen, to cut off as killing, to sacrifice, to covenant, to enshrine, to ensure a covenant by cutting off the sacrifice from the living, a covenant based on sacrifice. Ladies and gentlemen, my Jewish friends and family, the Messiah shall be killed regarding a sacrifice to be for a covenant to keep. Who says that? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? No. The book of Daniel. In the Old Testament, Daniel now gets a master's class on God's great plan of salvation. First of all, students, are you guys with me? Yes. I need you to stay awake, okay? First things first, on the screen, this is the Babylonian calendar. Uh, you can take a picture of it if you like. It means nothing to you. <laughs> except I show it to you for this reason. It is a Babylonian calendar and the reason why it's important to us and what we're about to do is because from Genesis to Revelation, your entire Bible, Old and New Testament, when it talks about days and years, is based upon a Babylonian calendar. 360 day calendar, 360. Those of you who are navigators, captains, pilots, sailors, there's 360 degrees on a compass, right? That comes from Babylon. This is a Babylonian calendar. And so here's what we're going to do. This might touch one person today. I'm really gambling here. You might walk out of your sand. That was insanity. 
Let's just hope that one person gets this. So here we go. Second, uh, second slide is this. I'm going to be going through uh, Daniel 9. I'm going to ask you to remember this. As we look through this, you see FC. FC stands for first coming. This is a very important legend to where we're going. SC stands for second coming. You guys ready? Here we go. So Daniel chapter 9. We'll do this together on the screen. Daniel 9.22 is where we begin. Daniel is speaking. He, this is an angel. We know from chapter 9, it's an angel who shows up. And uh, it's Gabriel that is speaking. And Gabriel is the public relations angel of heaven, apparently. Michael, remember I told you this a few months ago? Michael is the angel that fights everybody. Michael is pretty gnarly. He's the bad boy in heaven. Uh, he, beats, he beats up other... Michael, Michael will fight with Satan. They're, they're equals. Gabriel's equal, archangels, but Gabriel never, we never see Gabriel in a fight. We see, we see Gabriel talking. And he informed me and talked with me and said, oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, isn't it amazing? When you started praying, Daniel, the command went out. Heaven said, Daniel's praying. The command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Stop right there. Here we go. We're going to start in verse 24. Daniel is in captivity in Babylon. He was taken as a young teenager when Israel was captured by Nebuchadnezzar at the time as the general, not the king. He wasn't king yet. His dad was still alive. Nebuchadnezzar was the general. Daniel will never again see his nation in his life. So understand the vision, Daniel. And he speaks now Babylonian time because that's what they would have understood. 70 weeks or 490 years, that's what 70 weeks means in a ba on a Babylonian calendar. 490 years, these are special years. These are years that God spoke to Israel because of their disobedience. He told them, you didn't keep the Sabbaths. You didn't let the ground rest on the seventh year. You guys disobeyed my word, and so you owe me. You owe me 490 years. God tells Israel, you owe me 490 years. 490 years are determined. It's technically predetermined for your people, the Jews, and for your holy city, Jerusalem, to, watch, first coming, first coming. Daniel, this is what the future holds for your people and your holy city, even though I'm talking to you in Babylon right now. First coming. To finish the transgression, it means that there must be the dealing of sin. Number two, to make an end of sins. That means the dealing with sins will be by sacrifice. To make reconciliation for iniquity. So do you see FC, first coming, finish transgression. First coming, make rec reconciliation for iniquity. This is what Jesus did at the cross according to Old Testament theology. First coming, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Oh, but wait a minute. To bring in everlasting righteousness. That hasn't happened yet. Second, that applies to the second coming, to seal up vision and prophecy. Vision and prophecy is still being lived out in our lifetime, and it's yet coming. And to anoint the most holy. That happens at the second coming. That's not happened yet. Next slide. Know therefore and understand that from the end. So watch this. Know therefore and understand. So that from the end or the bookend on the left. Think about that. There's a bookend on the left regarding these 490 years. From the going forth. So the bookend on the left of this prophecy begins with. From the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Well, what's that? Well, guess what? We know. Archaeology has revealed it was March 14th, 
445 BC, King Artaxerxes told somebody, you know, Nehemiah, I'm going to give you permission to go back to Jerusalem, Nehemiah, and you can rebuild the streets and the walls, but it's going to be tough. But I'll pay for it, and I'll give you a passport to go there. Until, that's the other bookend on the right-hand side. So look at, look at me. Bookend is the commandment to go forth and restore and rebuild. Are you with me, everybody? Yes. Am I already losing you? If I'm losing you now, we'll never make it. <laughs> it starts over here regarding those special 490 years. It starts over here with the commandment to go forth and restore and rebuild. March 14, 445 B.C., until the other book end, or parentheses, we'll call it. Well, what's the other end? Well, the other end is this. The other end is until Messiah the Prince. You guys, this is the Jewish scriptures. There shall be seven weeks. That's, four, that's 49 years. To what? To do what? 49 years the Bible says, and 62 weeks, 49 years plus 434 years equals 483 years. How many, wait, how many years did we start with? 490. From the commandment by Artaxerxes, that starts the clock, to the coming of the Messiah, the Prince, that ends the clock for a period of time, it's 483 years. You guys should take a picture of this if you could think you're going to... By the way, credit should be given to where credit is due. We're very grateful for the deciphering of all of this by a guy by the name of Sir Isaac Newton. The Messiah shall be cut off. Killed as a sacrifice to establish a covenant. My Jewish friends, listen. The Messiah shall establish a covenant by being killed, but not for himself. Raise your hand if you can hear me. Not for himself, for you, for me. And the people of the prince, lowercase p, by the way, the prince who is to come. Ooh. We're going to keep reading. He's a sinister person. That after the 483rd year, a prince is going to come who's a bad man. So after the Messiah dies, who's cut off, not for himself. He, hasn't, he's not, he doesn't have to die for his own sins. He has none. He dies for our sins. When that's done and the bookends of that 483 years is complete... At some point in time after that, a bad prince is going to come. Okay? By the way, after the 483rd year, remains seven years to be fulfilled regarding Daniel's people and Daniel's holy city. Do you get the math? 483 from 490 is seven. By the way, listen, I don't want to get in an argument right here. We can fight out in the parking lot if you want, but... <laughs> Those of you who are post-tribulationists, this, this destroys your post-tribulational view right here. The, listen, a post-tribulational rapture view, that's insane because the rapture has nothing to do with Israel. This is all about, the seven years is all about Israel based on this prophecy. Dr. John Wolverid called this the holy of holies of Bible prophecy. So this guy that's coming, this prince, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end of it shall be with the flood until the end of the war. Desolations are determined. Next slide. Daniel 9, 22 to 27. He, the prince who is to come, shall confirm a covenant with many for class. One week, Babylonian time, seven years. But in the middle of the week, what's half of seven years? 
three and a half years. He shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined. In other words, the prince that's going to come after the tribulation period begins, he is going to halfway through, by the way, the Bible tells us it's 1,260 days from the beginning of the tribulation period. Write this down, bonus point. It's not, I don't have it in my notes. Second Thessalonians chapter two will be fulfilled when this prince will stand in the holy place in Jerusalem, which is to be rebuilt, a coming temple, and he's going to offer a sacrifice in Jerusalem, which will cause it to be made desolate. The Bible tells us that when Israel sees that, Jesus said, when you see it happen, don't even come back to your house to get your jacket. If you're on the top of your house, get down and run. Flee. The one that I'm telling you about, that prince, is known as the Antichrist. Mr. 666. If he had a phone number, that's what it would be. We know this by the oracles of God. Isn't it fascinating that you and I, are you with me? You and I are going through the Old Testament right now, thousands and thousands of years old, and we're reading about stuff that's still going to happen. Man, if you're, if you're not a, a believer, I don't know what in the world. Come on. <laughs> and listen, Christian, cheer up. Seven years, seven years, seven. Will the church go through the tribulation period? No, no. she's never seen in the tribulation period. Only Israel. Israel's featured in the tribulation period of seven years. The seven years is strictly Jewish. It's God getting that seventh year out of the 490 that they owed him. I'm sorry, I'm yelling at you. I get so excited over this. This stuff builds faith. Isaiah. Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. His name's Jesus. First Peter chapter two, verse six. For it stands in scripture. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Isaiah, uh, excuse me. Psalm 118, verse 25. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray. Send now prosperity. Verse 26. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's Psalm 118. 1,000 years old before Jesus was born. You say, well, what does that do with anything? Hang on, we're not done. (laughs) Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly, that's the word for, that's humble, and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Keep writing. Matthew 21, 8. Now a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You know what's interesting? You may choose to believe that or not. You may argue in your synagogue that that has nothing to do with Jesus. Isn't it fascinating That 2,000 years ago, those who lived it understood that it applied to Jesus then? Josephus tells us over 100,000 people were there. And they all got it wrong? (laughs) Do you hear me? This is, we are looking almost, it's almost like a crime scene investigation. Overwhelming evidence by eyewitness accounts. Numerous eyewitness accounts. Some favorable, some not favorable. You know, the Roman history never denounces or denies the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Roman history doesn't record it as as 
it not happening, and it records it as happening, so say the Jews and those Christians. So say his followers and his antagonists. For a further read, get your hands on the book if you can find it. The ARCO, A-R-K-O, the ARCO volume from Constantinople. And you can read Roman accounts. Fascinating. Matthew 23, verse 37. Jesus cries out and says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to you. Notice, watch this. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's the second coming. Amen. Did you know that? You guys okay? Yes. Okay. Matthew 21, verse 10. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? So the multitude says, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Matthew 24, verse 15. Hang on to your seats. Remember, we're talking about Daniel here. Matthew 24, 15. Jesus says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Friends, do any of you live in Judea? No, you don't. Let him who is on the house stop. Do you live on top of your house? No, no but the Jews do. Do not go down or take anything out of his house and let him who's in the field. Israel is a very, very uh, earthy, agar agrarian-based economy. Do not go back to get his clothes, but woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days and pray that your flight or your escape may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. Do you care about the Sabbath? Nope. For then there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. That's Israel. The elect is Israel. Watch. The elect is the tribulation saints and the elect is the church. Context determines which elect you're talking about. And remember this, just to, re, just to make sure we got this. It's chapter two of Romans. Romans 2, 28 and 29 reminds us who a real Jew is. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that is outwardly of the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter or the law, whose praise is not from men, hallelujah, but from God. All of a sudden, we see the God of all creation for all mankind revealing himself so blatantly clear in scripture. Men, I tell you what, last night, I don't know if you saw this last night, but one of the you know, the Bible tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God. And last night, I don't know what the arrangement will be this evening, but last night, last few nights, in the southwestern sky, I looked, you looked at the moon, just behind the moon, you could see Jupiter. To the right was Saturn, and Beaming like a headlight, looked like an airplane was going to land in your face. Last night was Venus. And I looked up there and I thought, the heavens declare the glory of God. Those, those bodies of light, oh, and oh, by the way, they, they shine the way they do. They, you know, they have no light of themselves. If the sun was to be put out, those, it'd be black. You wouldn't see a thing. Those, all of those things are reflecting the sun. All of the things that you see out there, that's the sun bouncing off of. A few of them are suns and other galaxies and other systems. Remarkable. 
I, I assumed you might ask a question, something like, how can you say that, Pastor Jack? How can you say that? How can, how can this be possible? Well, the Bible says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, there is neither, listen, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, watch this, then you are Abraham's descendants or seed and heirs, inheritors, the beneficiaries, according to the promise. According to the promises, the scriptures. Listen, Jeremiah, you guys okay still? Yeah. Jeremiah 31, 31, watch this, man, this, oh. I just said that the Bible says Jew and Gentile, all one, right? Watch Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day that I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. The Ten Commandments. My covenant, which I love this, my covenant, which they broke. <laughs> Though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Listen up, everybody, my Jewish friends. This is your Bible. I'm going to make another covenant with you. Second one, different one in those days. I will put my law in your minds and write them on your heart and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Well, I keep this rule. I keep this law. You need a new covenant. I didn't say that. Your prophet Jeremiah said it. And that's going to happen someday, you guys. After the tribulation period's over and Jesus returns, the remnant of the house of Israel that's saved. You know what Zechariah says about that? It's awesome. Zechariah 8, verse 23. This is awesome. It says, thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, 10 men, 10 Gentiles, from every language of the nations shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man and say, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. You see, finally, it's been a 2,000-year diversion. But there's going to come a day when the nations will grab the sleeve of a Jew and say, take me with you. We know that God is with you. We want to learn about your God. Isaiah tells us that the Gentiles will come to that light. Most of us happen to be Gentiles that have come to that light. And then with one and a half minutes left, do I do it? Let's just do it. Let's just do it. If you have to go, if you have to catch a plane, go now. I, I get it. Listen, verses four through six, the answer is we are all lost in and of ourselves. He says in verse four, certainly not. Indeed, let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, quotes the Old Testament. He's quoting Psalm 51, by the way. He's quoting King David. That you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. Simply this, God, it's crystal clear. You're the judge, we're not. And when you judge wickedness, you'll, you'll not have to defend yourself. Truth stands there. Listen, we try to defend the truth. All we need to do is repeat truth, ladies and gentlemen. You don't defend truth. Truth is, truth is, is a lion. Truth is, nobody messes with truth. They pretend that they do. But when it moves, look, for, for so long, people have been mocking God, making fun of God, using Jesus' name as a cuss word, and nothing's happened. The lion is just sitting there like this. The lion is truth. And then all of a sudden, we don't know when, the lion's going to stand up. And everybody that's been mocking God and insulting him down deep inside, knowing that they're disobeying a God that exists, they are going to turn ashen white when that lion roars. And he will come out of Zion, says the scripture. It's incredible. 
By the way, David, his psalm is quoted here by Paul. This is his psalm of repentance when he got caught in adultery with Bathsheba and murder of her husband. Wow. Look at verse five. But if our unrighteousness, watch, this is an argument that's it's a Jewish form of argumentation. We don't get it. I'm going to try to do my best to, to bring it to us. So if God is righteous, right? Yeah. And we're unrighteous? Yep. And God is gracious and loving? Yep. So if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? Paul says, I speak as a fool. I speak as a man. The thought was this. Remember I mentioned a few Wednesdays or Sundays ago, antinomianism? This is what it means. It means, wait a minute. The gospel you just told me, God forgives sins? Yes. And didn't you say that the person who's forgiven the most loves God the most? Yes. Well then, I'm going to go sin like a maniac. I'm going to rack up a truckload of sin because my sins reveal the righteousness of God. Because, it, listen, I'm not kidding. The argument means it gives God the opportunity to forgive me to show the world how kind he is. You say, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Have you ever heard people say, God just wants me happy? <laughs> I know, I, I know that I shouldn't be doing that, but nothing's happened to me. I've been living like that for years. Nothing's happened. After all, doesn't God want me happy? Watch, seriously. Isn't God a loving God? Isn't, isn't he, doesn't he love this uh, sinner, but hate the sin? Those are all antinomian arguments from people who love their sin more than they love God. They're conflicted because they're religious, but they're not born again. So they try to straddle the fence and they live in two worlds. They dress nice on Sunday morning for church but six days a week is a different world. No, we're lost in and of ourselves, friends, and we need his loving salvation. Amen. His awesome goodness. Question, is there unrighteousness, evil, and injustice in this world, ladies and gentlemen? Yes. Oh, yes. Answer, yes, unrighteousness can only be detected, by the way, if you and I understand that there is a righteousness. The only way that you know, if you're running around saying, that's unjust, oh, how do you know? <laughs> that's not fair. Who says? How do you know that? C.S. Lewis said, I would never know that that line that's crooked is wrong unless I would have known first that a line should be straight. How dare you judge others when you set up a standard without thinking that that standard applies to you? You see? Paul is setting a trap for their argument. He says in verse 6, certainly not. How then will God judge the world is the question. Oh, he's going to judge the world. We end in verses 7 through 8. It's this way. For if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory... Am I also still judged as a sinner? In other words, God can't judge me. So, listen, J.C. Ryle said this will be Judas's defense on the day of judgment. It was brilliant. His, the theology of this means this. Judas would then come forth and say, hey, I get off. Because I thinked on Jesus, wouldn't believe in him the way that I was supposed to, I wound up trying to present a different plan, turned him in on the religious hierarchy, 
and betrayed him. If it wasn't for me betraying Judas, he never would have, for uh, Jesus, he never would have gone to the cross. Seriously. All you guys should thank me, Judas is going to say. You should thank me for doing what I did or else you never would have known. You see where this is going? You see how hard this is to teach? The Jewish mind understands this form of logic. It's ridiculous. We use the term in our modern world, the end does not justify. This is where it came from. I'll do evil so God can look good. Aren't I a servant of God? Oh, sin with me. And together we will ask God to forgive us because he loves to forgive. He's gracious and merciful. That is the verbiage of a wolf. Charlatan and thief. And Paul says it's not going to work. We end verse 8. And why not say, let us do evil that good may come. As we, Paul, we are slanderously reported as some affirm that we say. We don't teach that, Paul is saying. And then he ends it with a mic drop. Their condemnation is just. You know what that is? Their belief system, if that's how it is, their damnation is on them. Strong words, right? Yes. So what's the moral of this? Where do we land this? Here's where we land it. God's word is so crystal clear that the Messiah had to be killed but the Hebrew word is regarding a covenant that is made by sacrifice. These are not my words. Church, you've been here for 55 minutes in this Bible study, 50, 60 minutes, 61 minutes. <laughs> and you just got some theology here right now that's pure Bible that no one on the planet can refute. You need to know that. If they go to the truth, they will have to agree. And therein is the issue. Will you surrender your religiosity for a true relationship with the living God?